Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the April RTD Accountability Committee meeting. It is a wonderful Monday. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, who is able to join. Um, the first uh, agenda item is any public comment. Um, I do see that there uh, is a hand raised. Um, staff, how are we, um, how do you wanna handle this? Should I just, I know there is a, uh, someone calling in that might wanna speak. Um, and then I see a couple hand hands raised. Um, Madam Chair, if you would like, if, if you wanna call on the person, I can unmute them. And uh, then obviously they'll have their three minutes to speak. And then um, I'll make the reminder for anyone on the phones uh, you can raise a virtual hand by hitting star nine, and then we'll unmute you and we'll call on you based on the last three digits of your phone number, and then you'll need to hit star six as well. Um, so Madam Chair, you can call on anyone and I'll unmute them and we'll give them the ability to speak. Wonderful. Thank you. Alrighty. Uh, the first person on my screen is um, Alex Hyde Wright from Boulder County. Good morning, committee members. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is Alex Hatter with Boulder County. Um, I just wanted to provide some um, comments and suggestions for fairs and past ideas that Boulder County staff have been working with. Um, I've been closely following the operations subcommittee's work on this topic. We wanted to provide our ideas for the committee's consideration. Um, the goals for our fairs and passes ideas be to rebuild ridership post COVID. Um, ensure equity for the system, create a, a fair structure and pass programs that are simple and easy to understand, um, that are fair, expedite the boarding process, and provide stable revenue to RGD. Um, so with those goals in mind, um, we have some ideas, um, maybe somewhat bold and provocative, but intended to be uh, conversation starters. Um, so launch into the fair's ideas. Um, so the first one is to get rid of the regional fair, just have a local and airport, um, then make the non-cash fair cheaper than the cash fair for both. Um, to incentivize the youth of my ride mobile and other non-cash options to expedite the boarding process um, to address the equity con uh, concerns of making the cash fare more expensive uh, would be to greatly increase the number of retail locations where people can purchase and reload my ride cards um, to make those nearly as ubiquitous as being able to board the bus with cash um, and then um, most significantly make all the discount groups fare free um, so for youth up to age 19, seniors, riders with disabilities, and anyone who qualifies with the LIVE program, just make that fare free. Um, on the pass side, keep the day and monthly passes, but add fare cappers and accumulators. Um, keep the eco pass program, but consolidate the business and neighborhood into a single uh, program and give a 25% discount off of um, the utilization-based retail price. Um, and then Thirdly, add a monthly pay-as-you-go option so organizations can purchase monthly passes um, for only their members that need it and have something um, in between the sort of all or nothing uh, with the current EcoPass structure. Um, a big way to, par uh, to pay for a lot of these ideas, since obviously they would lead to a pretty drastic reduction in fair revenue for RTD, um, would be to start charging for parking and char start charging a lot for parking. Um, so to shift um, the fair up to uh, shift the fair revenue um, that RTD is generating away from solely fares and towards fares and parking revenue. Um, so including it in district parkers, um, charge more for the close in lots, charge less for the further out lots, but charge everyone at all times. Um, and then retain um, the, the discrepancy that in-district parkers pay less um, than out-of-district parkers recognizing that they're paying the sales tax. Um, and then for parking passes, um, just like employers can elect whether or not to extend their EcoPass um, eco benefit to part-timers or not in their contract, um, they could also elect whether or not to cover their employees' parking costs um, in their contract. So if an employer wanted to cover all of, the, all of their employees' fares and parking costs at RTD, they could do that. Or if they just wanted to cover transit fares, they could elect to do that as well. Um, and with that, I think my three minutes is just about up. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Alex. Um, next up is Michael. I still am showing that Michael is muted. Michael, you'll need to unmute on your end. Yeah, um, this is Michael Ford. I didn't have anything. I think my uh, 
um, the computer must have been uh, indicating something that didn't need to be. So I apologize for that. No worries, Michael. I think you accidentally raised your hand if you can figure out how to replicate that at another time. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, next on my list is Ron Short with ATU 1001 Denver. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was briefly going over the reports that were made available on your website. And uh, <clears throat> two concerns, two concerns I have at this point going forward is uh, because of where, where RTD stands with empl employees and the availability of employees um, with the CARES Act money that's available and what the ref recommendations are for that monies. There's no concern expressed for the potential of mandating once again. And because of the levels of employment, because of uh, the layoffs that were done earlier this year, a lot of those employees did not return. There's going to be a, sort, a shortage of operators and mechanics and various other areas within RTD. So with that coming up, I hope that this committee would you know, look into that because this is a very real concern. And if this is not looked at or addressed, I see RTD going back into that spiral and you're going to be mandating at a lot of employees and it's going to come back to being a very undesirable job. And second, the, uh, I briefly looked over the, the potential for electri electrification of the fleet or looking at other, uh, uh, other sustainable opportunities for service. I know that um, RTD has delved into that realm a couple of times with minimal success. We had a lot of, there were a lot of failures on uh, equipment and things of that nature. So I just ask that the committee use caution going forward on that realm as well. There's other states that had electric uh, fleets that walked away because of the cost, maintenance things and other things. And I just don't wanna see the district going into something else, throwing money into a fire and burning it away. So if we could use, if, if I could ask the committee to use caution going forward and examine all these other municipalities that had electric vehicles. So uh, a hasty decision would not be made as far as that's concerned. And I'm not, by any means, I'm not saying that will be a hasty decision on anyone's part. I just want that to really be looked at. And that's all I have, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ron. And we um, really appreciate the input of our union community in, this, in these conversations. So um, please know that um, though we, we don't have decision-making power in this committee, we do um, try to incorporate any early flags or considerations that you offer. So thank you for joining us so that we can incorporate that, um, continually incorporate that um, into the conversation. Um, and I, I do want to recognize that we have our general manager, um, Ms. Deborah Johnson, on the line. Um, just wanted to give an opportunity. I know it's really important to have, you know, consistent communication. If Deborah, if you wanted to chime in at any point, uh, or sorry, at this time, um, in response to any of the comments made. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Good morning to the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to opine. I appreciate moreover, Mr. Um, Short's comments. And one thing I'd like to speak to that, um, RTD is in the process of leveraging a hiring uh, endeavor as we speak, recognizing uh, that there were mandated days, to my understanding, prior to me joining the agency. That's something that I don't support, recognizing that we could be putting people at risk due to the fact that they may not have adequate rest periods in between, recognizing that even though DOT has those times established, I don't know where people are residing. They're still driving to get to their homes and things of that nature. So that's something that we are working in partnership with the Amalgamated Transit Union on as we go forward, recognizing that that is optimal um, for not only only our employees to have adequate rest, but to ensure the safety um, of the uh, system holistically. Um, so that's all I have at this juncture. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Um, already, uh, co-chair's report. Uh, Elise, um, can you give us an update? Sure thing. It'll be short. I just wanted to let folks know that the um, RTD bill that we recommended is, is making its way through the General Assembly. It's House Bill 1186. It passed out of the House Transportation Committee on March 30th on a vote of seven to four. Um, I testified as did Lynn Geisinger and Deborah Johnson. Um, and one amendment was added to the bill, which was negotiated by labor and RTD. And it basically reinstated the 58% cap on uh, contracting, uh, but redefined how that was measured using more commonly used um, uh, transit terms. And then the house, um, it moved on to the full house and it passed on a vote of 38 to 24. And now it will move on to the Senate Transportation Committee. And I don't yet um, know of the date of that hearing. I don't know if anybody else has anything more updated than I do on that timing, but that's where things stand. Madam Chair. Yes, Rhett. I'd say I'm fairly optimistic as the chair of the transportation committee is also the prime sponsor of the bill, Faith Winter. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yes, and that was by design. Luckily, <laughs> um, they had input in, in this process. So um, yeah. strategic folks thinking before we even convene this, this group. So thanks, thanks to them. Uh, thank you, Elise. Um, and just a note, um, you know, as you know, we we this committee was built, and we've had folks appointed, and we didn't um, uh, necessarily. Um, it just seems relevant to comment, um, given that we've had a union representative speak, um, as well as you know, with Co-Chair Jones's comments around some of the amendments made. Um, I think that um, it's fair to just, I guess, share that you, we didn't have a necessarily a union representative. It's not that folks didn't. Um, support our unions um, on this committee. So um, I guess I'm not surprised to see that kind of through the normal um, legislative making process that some of those changes were made. So just a, a flag there. Um, and again, always welcoming feedback and uh, folks to comment as we move along in this process. Alrighty, um, March, uh, next agenda item, uh, attachment A. Um, has everyone had a chance to review the March 8th um, meeting summary? And are we... Um, okay with that. I think uh, that thumbs up would work. <laughs> my only my only suggested change is that um, the spelling of my last name. Um, I just have one R. And I might need to tap in Co Chair Jones to take us to the next item. You're on. That's right. My dog isn't barking right now. Okay, um, take it over from here. So we'll move on to um, subcommittee reports, starting with the finance subcommittee. Rut. Sure. On our March 17th meeting, it was a joint meeting with the uh, RTD Accountability Com uh, Committee's Operations Subcommittee. And it began with a debrief of the governance recommendations by Ron Pastor. Pat Storff, focused on the sub-regional uh, service councils. And members of both committees, uh, the operations and the finance subcommittees uh, contributed comments and concerns and suggestions in that time. We moved on to an in-depth discussion of performance measures for the RTD dashboard uh, led by Chair Dea Zavala. And uh, North Highland also contributed to those discussions. We concluded that meeting with a presentation by myself on the economics and opportunities of first last mile TNC partnerships. And then on our April 7th meeting, Rebecca White led a discussion of the goals and objective, objectives for a public facing RTD dashboard and some of the opportunities and challenges it presents. Again, Ron briefed us on the remaining unfinished corridors of the original Fast Tracks voter approved initiative, which was also a presentation that was to the board of RTD by RTD staff. Uh, Rut Bridges, myself, presented a financial analysis of the challenges presented by the Line B slash Northwest Rail 
and the large subsidies RTD would assume on its completion. And we discussed alternative of aggressively pursuing bus rapid transit combined with transit opportunities based on emerging technologies. Uh, it's our two committee meetings. Thanks, Rut. Any uh, questions for Rut on that report? All right, well, let's move on to the governance um, subcommittee report. And I think Doug is gonna provide that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, Julie was unable to be here today, so I'll give you a quick uh, quick update. Um, since our last meeting, last full committee meeting, we uh, the subcommittee finalized its uh, sub-regional service council recommendation, which you guys will have a discussion about later on in the agenda. Um, we're in the process right now of um, uh, drafting a partnership recommendation built off of the COVID relief funding recommendations that, that you all provided to RTD. And we hope to have that available at your next meeting because um, the governance subcommittees, um, I'm hopeful will finalize that recommendation at their um, meeting next Monday. And last but not least, we've initiated the conversation, which is the third focus area of the of the governance subcommittee on the RTD service area. So those um, that's progressing nicely. And with the timeline we have, um, which we also have a conversation about here in a little bit, we're, uh, we're moving, we're going as quick as we can in governance subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that update. Um, and then we'll pass it off to Dea to finish this out. Um, so as you all heard uh, from Rutt, there was a joint meeting on March 20 or March 27th, sorry, March 17th um, with the Finance Committee to discuss the um, dashboard that has been a point of conversation in the Operations Committee as well. On April 7th, um, the Operations Committee went a little bit deeper on the conversation around the dashboard with North Highland facilitating a conversation as well as sharing a few recommended um, uh, metrics that both can be found on RTD and others that we may want to consider. Um, so that is moving along. Our recommendation, um, at least the, the conversation that North Highland facilitated, focused on fair service and customer service. Um, there was also a fairs roundtable, fairs and pass roundtable that was hosted by Mile High Connects on March 29th. The purpose was really to lift up um, some of the recommendations that Alex with uh, Boulder County lifted up a little bit earlier, but to hear from anchor institutions, including universities and school districts about what is um, currently being used when it comes to the youth fair um, and other past programs. So we are hoping to take that information and really package it into the fairs recommendation from the operations committee. So two recommendations will be coming forward, one focused on the dashboard and potential metrics, and then the second on fairs and past structures. That is it for the operations committee. Thank you, Dea. Alrighty, uh, can we get an RTD update? Um, and this is uh, attachment B, and this is the response to the recommendations on COVID relief spending. I'm not quite sure who's gonna be taking this agenda item. Uh, Madam Co-Chair, this is Deborah Johnson. I will be addressing this item. Okay, wonderful, go ahead. All right, thank you very kindly. So um, it's my pleasure to summarize um, our responses to the accountabilities committee initial recommendations. I provided this committee um, a response in a letter dated March 29th, and I'll just take a couple of minutes just to highlight what those comments are. Recognizing the committee's first recommendation related to a transparent process and clear priorities for use of the CRISA funds, I want you to know that um, the agency is committed to continuing a transparent process for communicating clear priorities for use of any of those relief and recovery uh, funds that are made available um, through the Federal Transit Administration. As relates to addressing the committee's recommendation to strategically recall those employees that were impacted by the workforce reduction, um, as you heard, uh, once RTD learned of the CRISA funding, and I'll speak specifically for myself, I issued an immediate rescission of previously uh, laid off frontline employees to maintain staffing levels and support operations, again, following the intent in which the legislation was drafted. The committee also recommended that um, the agency share the funds with other transit providers. 
Um, RTD's contracted service providers, as you know, play a significant and invaluable role in the district's ability to provide service across the expansive um, service area in which we have here in the metro region. With that as a backdrop, um, we have provided financial support to contractors during the pandemic and will continue to support these partnerships to supplement RTD's fixed route and paratransit services and maintain the continuity of such. To address the item on implementing a reduced flat fare for six months to rebuild and um, to rebuild ridership and attract new customers. Um, as you've heard me say in numerous uh, uh, settings that we are taking a holistic approach at rebuilding ridership and looking to develop a ridership growth recovery plan, uh, given the financial impacts of the pandemic. I, along with my team, have heard from many customers across the region about the challenges associated with the agency's current fare structure and past programs. And, you know, I do recognize the need to reevaluate the fare structure and will continue to look for opportunities to write price fares for those who rely on transit most. Uh, the key will be part of the recovery plan as we look to conduct a system-wide fair study and equity analysis and adherence to Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and Executive Order 12898, which speaks to environmental justice. Approaching fares holistically across the region and RTD's whole body of services will ensure an equitable delivery of and access to transit. As for improvement of the past programs, um, you know, I wholeheartedly agree as long as, as, uh, as well as my team, that there are opportunities to improve the agency's past programs, especially the Eco Pass, College Pass, and the Lyft programs. Um, you know, collectively, we feel similar pain points to those felt by our customers who use the past programs, and my team and I are committed to continuous improvement to optimize and improve those past programs. Um, the agency, much like the Accountability Committee, we agree that helping with vaccine distribution is important. Um, RTD staff has engaged with local and state health officials on ways the agency can assist with the vaccine distribution due to the numerous vaccine events across the metro area. Uh, here at the agency, we promoted how customers can conveniently use um, RTD services to get to vaccine sites. Additionally, uh, we provided free shuttle service uh, for the large SCL health distribution event at the Nas National Western Stock Show Complex. Uh, providing uh, complimentary rides to and from the parking area to the vaccination site. Also, um, the agency has made its Lakewood Wasworth parking structure available to stride for their vaccine distributions, which occur Tuesday through Thursdays, as long as deemed necessary. Um, I do wanna say that we have been engaged in conversations and I personally had been for a while in recognizing some of the, some of the difficulties in trying to provide transport when you have pop-up clinics, one thing for certain is that we are continuing to stay engaged with that so we can quickly pivot and be a true partner, uh, recognizing the importance of getting folks vaccinated. And then regarding leveraging new partnerships, um, historically this agency has prided itself on being a key partner in the regional collaboration model uh, which, you know, Denver, uh, the metro area is known for nationally. So collaboration has been central to RTD's history of forging partnerships that create valuable mobility options. Um, exploring partnerships will be part of the Reimagine RTD effort as staff works with regional partners on a mobility plan for the future. And then more so continuing to focus on partnerships will be key to providing the transit of the future to get people uh, to places where they need to go when they want to get there. So with that, I want to reiterate my appreciation. I know the board does as well, as well as my team um, in reference to the work that the accountability um, committee has done to make these recommendations to strengthen the agency's operations and promote transparency. And um, I look forward to continuing to engage with this committee as we work to meet the committee's goals. So with that, I'll yield the floor. Thank you very kindly for the opportunity to um, present this information. Thank you, Deborah. Um, wanted to open it up to the wow. committee if there are any additional comments. All right, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Co-Chair Jones to take us through the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so the next agenda item moving into sort of action items is um, the, whether or not the committee would like to uh, submit a letter of comments to bill sponsors on the proposed transportation funding legislation. And just by virtue of a little bit of um, background, the 
our, our favorite transportation um, bill sponsors, Faith Winter and Matt Gray have worked um, with the governor's office on putting together a major transportation funding proposal. As you recall, um, uh, our state has gone to the ballot several times in the last few years to try to do that via ballot initiative, and those have failed. Um, this proposal would use um, raising fees as a way to generate revenues for the transporta our transportation system, thereby bypassing the need to go to the ballot and just have the legislature do the work. And um, the, the proposal has not yet been introduced, but a, a very lengthy slide deck, which is attached to our agenda, um, is what the, the um, future bill sponsors have released for sort of public discussion. That's being, they're receiving feedback now and anticipate introducing something in the next week or two. And um, I don't know if, if Dr. Cog staff wanna go through the proposal in any detail, but um, if, you, if you go to um, page 43 of the agenda packet, that's where you sort of get into the meat of the overall proposal which is nearly $4 billion over the next decade for transportation funding. Um, the bulk of that goes through the um, existing HUTF funding formula, which sends um, uh, over half to the state, uh, C, uh, CDOT, and the others split between cities and counties. Um, a, a, the reason that the committee would get, well, I'll, and I should say there's a whole series of fees on page 45, um, everything from um, uh, an increase in the amount you would pay for gas for your vehicle starting in a couple of years, um, increase in electric vehicle fees, delivery fees, taxi fees, and so on. And these all combine to create the funding stream. There would also be um, a contribution from the general fund as well for this this transportation packet. Um, the reason that the, the RTD Accountability Committee um, has been, the members have been thinking about weighing in on this is um, whether or not the allocation for multimodal um, transport, the transit and bike ped is adequate and I will say that both in the finance subcommittee and the oper governance operations, I can't remember, um, members indicated that they thought it would be useful for us to weigh in to speak on behalf of um, the committee on, uh, on urging an increase in multimodal funding. So um, uh, the, the concern is that only about 28% of the funds available in this rather complex package or would be going to multimodal. Um, and this is sort of counter to the direction that the state needs to go um, in the governor's climate roadmap, which, re which calls for a 10% reduction in VMT by um, 2030. And that's gonna require huge investment in transit. Um, conversely, the, the more we invest in road capacity expansion, the more we sort of head the wrong way in terms of emissions and VMT. So trying to strike the right balance. I will preface my comments by saying that the package is actually pretty good when it comes to electrification, and it represents a very substantial investment in both um, charging infrastructure and um, and moving forward with actual vehicle purchase. So um, that's where, that's sort of the context for this today's discussion. Um, we can um, stop and ask questions about what um, the bill sponsors and the governor are currently proposing, or we could move towards, um, I was tasked with putting together a draft letter I was not able to do that fast enough to get it into the uh, agenda packet for today, but I have a draft that I could share on my screen and we could walk through that. Um, so let me just stop and see what the committee's um, 
prerogative is. I guess we could start with a straw poll on whether or not indeed the full committee thinks the idea of having the committee weigh in is a good idea. So there's, is there any reaction to that? Elise? Yes? Um, I, I think it would be appropriate. I mean, we've opined on things that impact, I guess, the future of these conversations. So I don't have any objection um, uh, in terms of moving forward there. I would want to incorporate, um, you mentioned, <laughs> we're in the middle of puppy training. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's not going very well. Um, yeah, so we, you mentioned the, the comment on electrification and then just wanted to elevate the conversation or comments made by the union partners. So just making that connection, if we're gonna um, uh, give a recommendation or um, give an opinion on this, just making sure we're incorporating um, the concerns that were made on the electrification. But I would be uh, in favor of moving forward with that. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I support what Crystal said and, and just start to start with, thank you, Elise, for the having to paw through that whole bill. I know how, how complex it is to read legislation sometimes. Uh, I, I do uh, want to make sure that everyone has a chance to actually read and, and comment on what your draft is. Um, uh, and it's, it's a little tricky because we really have to get this done right away if we're gonna influence the legislation in a significant way. And so I, I recognize the urgency of it. it. It could be that it could be done in such a way that people get to see it and then they get to comment back and express their support or, or their lack of support. But I, I, I really encourage everyone to support this, uh, uh, this push for multimodal and more funding for multimodal that matters. And it's also some of the least expensive solutions that we have for reducing BMT. Well, so I, I think, Rhett, you raised some really important points. I think what we could accomplish today is to get um, thumbs up or thumbs down on sending a letter, answer any questions people might have about um, the uh, bill sponsor governor proposal out there, um, and then maybe uh, sort of walk through the outline of the proposed draft and get some, any initial feedback that people wanna give and then let people email it to, to everybody in the committee so that you can have, I don't know how we can set a deadline but at least a couple of days to actually go through and read and suggest any fine tuning that's necessary. I don't think it's fair to ask people to read something and approve it in a committee meeting but if people are amenable to doing that over email um, later on in this week. I think it would be helpful if we actually set something up this week if we're going to um, weigh in. I agree and I very much agree with a very short deadline to get that done. Two days is okay. enough. So yeah, let me just do it. Dan put up a stub. Uh, do people want to weigh in with this on this on this proposal? Thumbs up. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any, um, I'm seeing thumbs up or no thumbs. Rebecca, it sounds like maybe you're, recre you're sitting out this one because yeah. of your role with the administration and that's totally understandable. So, so then let's move forward from the place of we are gonna weigh in and I wanna create the opportunity. What was in your packet was the proposal um, as we know it now from, um, Faith Winter, Matt Gray, and the governor, see if there's um, sort of questions that people might have around that. And I will also add, stop and see if, if Ron Papstorff from Dr. Ka wants to add or help answer any questions since he is the master of all things transportation. Uh, thank you, Co-Chair Jones. Certainly not the master of all things transportation, but I am fully prepared to at least attempt to answer any questions. I think you did a great job of um, uh, presenting the overall structure of the concept as we, um, as we know it today. So what questions, if any, do, do committee members have about um, what has been proposed? Co-Chair Jones. Yes, Crystal. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm looking at the distribution of revenue in the plan and I see that there's an 18% 
allocated for municipal and 22% county. I'm curious um, if you have information on that stakeholdering process. You know, Aurora, for context, has also um, ebbed and flow in conversations around transit funding. And I've always, um, it's like chicken or egg. Do we wait for the state to implement something? Um, because we know that statewide um, makes a lot of sense. Do we wait? Um, we have a large deficit of transportation maintenance. And, you know, I guess I'm just trying to understand um, what that stakeholding process looks like. I can answer in broad brush terms. That is the historic um, distribution formula for HUTF or gas tax monies. And the political decision was made that actually changing the formula, which is something I think cities would really love to do is too controversy on political and that so that they would just use the existing formula, which is, as you indicated, that, that split between CDOT, cities and counties, and that um, uh, cities, particularly in the metro area, would um, get more funding through um, one of the funds that is created is a non-attainment fund for ozone non-attainment area, which is largely the metro area and the Northern Front Range, would be an additional pot of funds that um, communities could tap into um, to address transportation emissions. Um, so that was sort of the, the, I think the political thinking. Ron, what would you add to that? I, I think that's exactly right. The highway user tax fund um, is the way the about 70% of the money um, is proposed to be distributed. And that 60, 22, 18 formula split between the state counties and municipalities is the historic uh, formula, um, and I, I think it largely was a political calculation to stick with the historic formula for, for distributing that piece. I will add, Co-Chair Jones, the Multimodal and Mitigation Options Fund is also proposed to be split 60% um, for local priorities and 40% to um, CDOT for statewide priorities, and that 60% for local priorities would be distributed through regional organizations to local government uh, priority projects. So through MPOs like Dr. Cog and through uh, the rural transportation planning regions around the state. And Elise, if I could just follow up um, on, on that last piece of it in particular, and, and Crystal, I will tell you the Metro Mayor's Cog has really had long, hard conversations about the HUTF formula. And uh, I think I banged my head against a, a wall, uh, a ceiling, and, and, a, and a transit bus for long <laughs> enough, and I recognize it's not changing. Uh, I think that's a fight that we're going to, a dialogue that we're going to continue to try and have because just um, HUTF relies on vehicle registrations to account for population, and, and in the Dr. Cog region, uh, we have 57% of the population, but only 49% of the vehicle registrations. So it's really not, HUTF needs to have a hard look at it. I think we've acknowledged that's not gonna happen right now. And I think it's very important that we get additional transportation funding. But to the points that Ron made, I think I would like to just throw out for the body to consider that, um, that, that the multimodal option funds should be distributed through the MPOs and the TPRs based on population and, and transit usage and that it shouldn't go, have to go through CDOT. Um, and, uh, and, but if they choose to go that way, if, if they wanted to go through CDOT, we, we would suggest, or I would propose that it goes 85% local, 15% CDOT split, which is what happened with, um, it was SB 18-001 and CDOT project should be identified in conjunction with the MPOs, TPRs. So I'd like to see that multimodal options fund come more controlled, more local control over those dollars than having to go through CDOT. And that would be a recommendation I'd like the body to consider. Thank you, Jackie. Rhett, oh, and then, then Doug, then Dan. I just wanna make a historical comment on why that 22, uh, that, why that seeming imbalance in distribution of those funds, what it goes back to. When you look at rural areas, uh, which is what the counties tend to be, the rural areas actually have a lot more roads per person than we do in the cities. 
And so the, the tradition was to give us somewhat larger proportion because those counties are really uh, the ones that often maintain a lot of the roads that are a critical part of the state's infrastructure. And so there, there is a basis in, in, uh, in thought in terms of how that money was distributed that goes back a long way in Colorado and, and trying to get Colorado to change that, uh, I think would be uh, something that would, that would have a lot of broad opposition. It's a tough issue to try to open up when you're trying to pass that transportation legislation, which will benefit all of us. So I'd, I'd have to say I, I would oppose raising that issue for that reason. Thanks for that historical context. Rhett, Doug, then Dan, and then Dea. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Um, I, I don't know if the mayor mentioned this right at the end of her comments. My screen froze for a second, but I did want mentioned because the multimodal options fund percent split was mentioned in the proposal. The non-attainment pot um, as currently proposed um, is a hundred percent would be controlled by CDOT and would not flow through the, the NPOs and TPRs. I just wanted to point that out for clarification. Thank you. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I don't really understand how all of this money is going to flow. Uh, it's pretty complicated. And I think some transparency about who's going to get what would really be helpful. Um, what I do think I understand is that for RTD and transportation authorities like the Rolling Fork Transportation Authority, our option to get at this funding would come through the MPO and through the TPRs because the rest of it's going out to the counties and the cities. Um, in our TPR, based on information that Ron provided, uh, there would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $10.7 million available over 10 years, which is roughly $1.1 million a year to be split amongst five transit systems and RAFTA. RAFTA is the second largest transit system in Colorado. And it's just not adequate. We, we would not get a direct set aside from any of this funding. We would have to compete for it with other transit systems and communities or anybody that wanted to uh, submit a proposal to the TPR. So um, it sounds like a lot of money, but it really isn't. And then RTD would be in kind of a similar position with something like um, $13.2 million available for uh, the greater front range communities that RTD would have to compete with. So I really think that more money needs to be put in this bill for a multimodal uh, to give transportation authorities. We're one, there's RTD, that's a transportation district, but I think there's two or three other transportation authorities um, in the state. And uh, we would have to either try to uh, persuade the local counties and the uh, cities, municipalities in our region to give us some of their multimodal funding when it's not going to be very much and uh, it's, it can be all used, you know, fixing potholes and that sort of thing. So uh, anything that we can do to make the pot bigger would be greatly appreciated by transportation authorities and the largest transit system in the state, RTD. Thanks for those comments, Dan. Daya? Yeah, I just wanted to echo um, a few of Dan's comments. I, I, this is a very complex uh, bill. And so just really trying to figure out what, what would be RTDs or what might eventually reach RTD. I think it's just a question that I have. I also want to lift up the previous um, or one of the previous com public comments from the ATU around workforce and electrification. Um, and, you know, I see multimodal investments that focus on um, low and moderate income e-bikes. And then of course, um, moving the fleet towards electric electrification. And this is more just like a question because I'm not sure if it's within this bill or somewhere else, but can this be used to build kind of that workforce of the future and address some of the workforce challenges that RTD has been facing um, and still help us meet our 
um, longer term environmental goals when we think about moving towards electrification. So that's more of a question. Um, I don't know if that's something anyone on this call has a, has a response to, but wanted to share that as an immediate reflection. Those are good questions. I, I, I don't know if you all caught some of the newspaper reporting, but this proposal does not directly allocate to RTD. And the governor, you might have read, said that was fine with him, that RTD needed reform, not money. Um, and I, well, I greatly appreciate the governor's leadership on, on many things. I am, I'm very troubled by those comments because I think they, they represent a disconnect between um, what his climate roadmap is saying we need to do with transportation and his goals around um, equity and mobility and the fact that um, RTD is our, our biggest <laughs> transportation um, agency in the state and transport transit as a whole, RAFTA, RTD and, and, and local um, transit opportunities are not well funded in this bill. And so I do think we need to provide some, some firm um, uh, uh, I don't say push back, but just a reality check on, listen, if we are serious about addressing mobility, sustainability, and equity, we're going to need to have a greater investment in transit. And that includes, I think, um, points with regards to electrification. Um, I, 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 Obviously we wanna do it right. Electrification is the way of the future. And the, the tricky part about electrification is it requires an upfront investment, mm -hmm. but the payoff long-term is good. So um, if we can do that right, that investment so that we can assure that the, the vehicles and the systems we're putting in place work well and are maintained and, the, and, that, um, and that workforce is capable of, of, of making that transition, then we will save money in the long run and reduce emissions. So I think the key is to do it right. And fortunately, I think the, the that's one piece of this proposal that I think is done better um, than the other is the electrification piece. And we certainly have this added component from the federal government about investing in electrification as well. So I think that, that we can, can do that piece right. Um, but where I think our voice could be heard healthily is we need more funding for, for multimodal if, if we're going to get where we need to go, both for RTD and for transit agencies around the state. Any other sort of responses or comments or questions on the proposal? Because if not, I'll, I'll throw the draft that I put together um, up on the screen and just sort of walk us through it. Elise, the only other comment I would have is regarding the non-attainment funding as well, is that there just be more, uh, I think the body is aware of the fact that we are not in compliance with the federal ozone standards. And, um, and so there will be more asked uh, of the metro region on this issue, and it's going to be more costly. And um, I think transit really is a solution to that as, as transportation is. Uh, right now, the leading cause of ozone precursors in our area. So I do think the non-attainment needs to be addressed in, in, as well as the multimodal option fund. And I, and I feel like, again, um, I would just like to see not all of the dollars have to throw, flow through CDOT. Um, and, and that's the way the bill has structured the non-attainment monies as well. Okay. All right, um, so I'm gonna attempt to share my screen unless Dr. Cog's staff have it readily um, available to share theirs. What's your preference? I, ha I have it up and ready, Elise, if you- if All you... right, it's always better when somebody else does the technology, I'll be <laughs> honest. <laughs> well, well, we'll see if that pans out this morning. <laughs> And what my proposal is, we'll share the screen and maybe just walk through the intent of, of the various letter. And there's a lot of words on these pages. So again, nobody will be expected to sign off or maybe even fully grasp um, this, this draft. You can take it home, sleep with it and provide, provide feedback. <laughs> so the first paragraph is just thanking them for their leadership um, and focusing our main ask is around increasing um, the funding for transit and multimodal. 
the second paragraph, so I'm not going to spend much time on the niceties. Um, the second paragraph really uh, speaks to our creation and, and, and our committee um, and what we've learned um, about the importance, the benefits that transit has, both for the users of the system and for everyone else in terms of reducing um, traffic congestion, um, addressing uh, environmental sustainability and the like. And I guess that's, that's really the third paragraph goes into the weeds on that. To explain why we feel it's important for us to weigh in is to go through these benefits. And these benefits are for the, for the greater good of the community. And I go through and um, list mobility, equity, for those who can't drive or can't afford to drive, um, the traffic congestion for those people who still do drive, uh, traffic congestion reduction for those who still do drive, um, reducing air pollution like our ozone issue um, and, and the fact that we're out of attainment, um, and the importance of, of transit in meeting the goals that are laid out in both the 1261, House Bill 1261 climate targets and the governor's subsequent climate roadmap. And I and point out that the since the majority of funding actually goes to roads and not just repairing existing roads, but expanding roadways, that, that actually takes um, us into a deficit when we're trying to reduce VMT and reduce emissions. And so there needs to be a better balancing. So the next paragraph says, so consequently, we don't think there's enough um, done for multimodal and, and encourages a, more, a better balancing between transit and road, road capacity. And, and then the, the next few paragraphs start going into some of the more in-depth in rationale for that. So the first, that, that paragraph, the next paragraph talks about how RTD in particular receives significantly less money than other transit agencies in other states across the country. Just to give a reference point that the state does not invest in our biggest transit agency. And as we're asking RTD to in increase ridership and accomplish all these public benefits, we're asking them to do so with relatively little investment from Colorado. Um, the next year talks about the 10 year plan, which CDOT worked very, very hard on. And while it's much better in, in the multimodal front than prior um, transit uh, transportation plans, um, and uh, it does not have as much transit as, as need be. Um, and the, the, the next paragraph after that talks about how Dr. Cog has actually, which is the RTD area has identified significant uh, transit in the form of bus rapid transit projects that need funding. So um, RTD is not funded by the state. The 10 year plan that we're working off doesn't have as much transit as it needs be and needs to have in, in the funding scheme. And yet Dr. Cogs outlined significant um, opportunities and needs for more transit investment. And so then the final paragraph mentions the, the point, and this was borne out by recent research, that investing dollars uh, in transportation and operations is key. Uh, this is to, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, right now, the, the bills are focused, the, the bill proposal is focused on capital. What's important for transit is not just construction, but it's ongoing operations and maintenance. And so we wanted to um, make it clear that dollars through this transportation proposal could flow to those purposes. And then I, the final point was that if you increase transit service, you increase the ability for workers to get to, the, to jobs and expand their opportunities for jobs, which is important both for the economy and for equity. So, that's sort of a walkthrough uh, uh, of the proposed letter. It's, I agree it's complex. The proposal we're commenting on is complex. Um, and, and several of you have already mentioned places that you'd like to add emphasis. So with that, um, why don't we 
take down the letter and throw open the conversation at least for another five to 10 minutes to get feedback and ideas um, about people's thoughts on this draft. Crystal? Yeah, so um, thank you for um, taking the, the time to, to pen this um, or type it rather. Um, my high level thoughts on, on, and I look forward to reading it actually more in depth as well, but um, a couple of things. In the meantime, like we, this is all building towards a more sustainable future. It takes time, it takes resources. Um, I guess, is there anything um, that we can include kind of in the meantime? And where I'm going with that is, um, you know, there were days that the environment fared very well um, when we were all working from home, right? Um, so I think acknowledging um, and encouraging businesses um, to lean into kind of the 21st century workforce and, and the, the capability that um, COVID has kind of forced us to have with these, you know, remote meetings, um, but also if it's, you know, not necessary to travel, um, giving employees, encouraging businesses to give employees the autonomy to be able to, to choose that if possible. Um, I, you know, I, I would love to just say that mass transit is the answer, but at this moment, we don't all have the infrastructure to be able to say that. So I think this is, um, I think, futuristic and moving forward, but I'm left with the, what about in the in-between kind of phase? So um, high level, that, that would be my, my thought in wondering if that could be incorporated. Um, and then my additional comment is any, anywhere we, we mention transit, um, I think we have to talk about development and housing. Um, I don't want those to be competing issues, but often I see that we are making really great strides in transit, but we aren't having the accompanying development um, to support, um, you know, the chicken and the egg conversation. But we, you know, we need housing. We need the businesses around there, but we also need kind of the equity equity conversation. What type of housing? What types of businesses? Uh, because we know that. Um, and we see that in Aurora, there's no requirement on that affordability. Um, and so we see kind of luxury um, development go around transit and those are not our high transit users. So we are all, already setting ourselves up for an unsustainable future. Um, and I'd love to welcome folks um, and it, you know, again, encourage folks to write it, but we can't, I guess, say one thing and then not actually you know, have it on the back end. So again, I know we don't have purview over that, but this feels, to me necessary to um, incorporate that. Maybe I'm asking too much of one letter, but I don't know, I just feel strongly about the, the two comments I made. Thanks for those. Yeah, I think we just have to figure out as, as the RTD Accountability Committee, um, our credibility and leverage is through the lens of, of our work. And we, we definitely have um, waited on sort of multimodal writ large, which includes telecommuting, and we've weighed in on TOD, affordable TOD, equitable TOD. So I appreciate those comments in that context. Who? I think who Crystal else? just wrote the introduction to our final report. I guess that it's not it's not the. Uh, uh, I, I I love everything you said. I just don't know that this letter on a transportation bill is the best place to put that. So just maybe thinking. Uh, I know they're receiving a ton of feedback on this. Um, maybe confine it a little bit more in the lanes of direct comments on the bill, but I think the comments that were made need to be preserved and and as we conclude the work of this body to, to incorporate it there. So, uh, <clears throat> and Elise, I just have to say a huge thank you to you for uh, taking this on and and getting and getting it done. Um, and and my uh, only comment would be. Uh, just the, the idea of uh, the MPOs um, and, and maybe it says the MPOs, TPRs, having a greater say in the transit dollars as well and working with our partners to do that. So, and then, and then to me, the non-attainment, I think that's another source of multimodal dollars, in my opinion, for uh, at least the Dr. Cog region um, and, and, and parts of the North Front Range. To, to invest in, in transit to solve some of those issues. So that, those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you. And credit where credit's due, where the letter really wonks out. I had some help from 
staff at the organization I now uh, I now work at. Rebecca, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I, I do just want to note for the record that I, I will abstain from any vote on this. But I guess it, just a, a, a point that I'd like to make is that, you know, this is the RTD Accountability Committee, and this seems to be wading into issues of statewide legislation. And there are many pieces of statewide legislation that I think the committee could could deliberate on, but I, I'm not I'm not quite following why this committee would weigh into issues that are beyond the strict focus of, of what's before RTD and the challenge we've been given. So just a, a little bit of a concern there that we're kind of coloring outside of our uh, original objectives. Rebecca, could I just um, make sure I understand, are you suggesting we shouldn't weigh in on this legislation at all or just where we weigh in, we should combine ourselves to the geography of RTD? The geography and the, the more the latter, um, the geography and the, the mission of RTD, the, the responsibility we have under the, the mandate we were all given. Got it, thank you for that input. Other comments? Dan. Well, um, at least to me, it, it, it appears that RTDs, it's gonna need more funding uh, in the years ahead in order to be able to um, accomplish its mission and to help improve the environment and reduce carbon emissions and so forth. So I think it's appropriate for this committee to to weigh in and, and provide a mechanism for RTD to, uh, to get at some of this funding. Um, this is a 10 year bill. Uh, when is transit going to have a seat at the table and be able to get uh, adequate funding uh, to uh, help the state achieve its mobility goals and, and to help the environment and so forth? If we don't do it now, when, when is it gonna happen? Uh, the only other recommendation that I would make with respect to your letter, Elise, which I think is excellent, is that maybe we should, we should think about suggesting uh, some source of funding for multimodal uh, transportation, which is dedicated, like uh, increase in the vehicle registration fees. Uh, I know that they were raised fairly significantly um, for faster, for the faster funding program, um, but when the gas tax is only going to cost people about $10 a year, and, and that's kind of the problem that we're trying to solve, it seems like uh, the, 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 you know, vehicles and traffic and so forth ought to pay a higher price to help offset their impacts. Um, so I, I would just throw out some suggestion for uh, the legislature uh, legislators to to be thinking about in terms of where you know some funding might be available. I don't know if there's any limitations; they can't go any higher, or what have you. But I notice on the list of things that um, vehicle registration fees are not included, and there's a lot of cars out there. I will just say that the limitations on um, uh, revenue generation relate to the fact that you're using fees, not taxes, fees. In order to actually qualify for fees and not require um, going to the ballot, um, the, the, the funding that's generated has, has to be directly related from the source it was generated from and serve, in service of that. And um, how far a field it can get is the, the source of litigation um, to be sure. So um, that's really why it's a compilation of fees one can make the case um, for increasing some of those fees and how they relate, but but that case has to be made. That's really the limitation. So, Rut, and then Rebecca, is your hand still up? Do you have more to say or are you just, no, okay. Rut? Uh, I just wanted to uh, go back to some of the things that Dan had said there. I can't agree more that, that uh, without some other source of funding, RTD is gonna have a, a tough time getting through the next couple of decades. If you look at 
if you look at where the money we get, for example, Fast Tracks is funded by the 0.4% sales tax uh, slice. Uh, and, and the reality of that is that two thirds of that right now is going to pay the debt on all of the, all of the trains that have been built and all the rail that's been built. And, and the rate at which we're paying off that debt, four fifths of that, those payments go to interest right now. And so, you know, how do we get out from under that? You know, where, where are the revenues left to run our, our rail system? And it is a really tough question. The three latest uh, uh, rail lines that we've added are really underperforming in terms of ridership. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real struggle. There is a big problem there, but the only funding that the voters have approved for RTD is that slice of sales tax, that 1% slice of sales tax. And I don't know any way that without going to the voters that can change. And if we go to the voters to change it, I, I'm pretty sure I know how that's gonna turn out. So it, as chair of the finance committee, thanks a lot. <laughs> that's a tough problem. So, Thanks for that, Rudd. Um, I'm gonna try to wrap up this conversation because we have a couple other things to get to on our agenda, but I wanna do last call. Lynn, did I notice body language that you wanted to weigh in? Uh-oh. No, you didn't, but um, I will weigh in. Uh, you know, I appreciate this. I think it would be something that uh, um, if you write it, I, you know, I. It, it's a, an area that I think the whole board should speak to. Um, I think the letter, you did a great job of, of putting to, of marshalling the arguments. Um, so yeah, I really don't have a lot to add. Okay. Thank you. I just saw you lean forward. I just, what I'm trying to, you know, do the Zoom intuition. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So any last call for comments? Okay, so I guess the question is, how fast is reasonable to ask you all for um, to actually go through and get to read this and um, send in any additional comments, knowing that time is of the essence because we want to weigh in before the bill actually gets drafted or finalized. Rhett, did you have something to say on that? Two days. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so this being one, tomorrow being two, close of business tomorrow for any, and some, I, I've captured the comments that have been made today and I'm sure Ron has too. And we can try to see if we can incorporate um, those ideas, but any specificity that you can provide would be greatly appreciated. So that will be our task, close of business tomorrow, please. And if you don't have any comments, could you still just, drop an email saying you're good to go, that would be helpful as well. All right, then I'm gonna move us off of this topic and turn it over to Doug to discuss service council recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that was a great discussion. Um, what time we got? Three minutes left. Well, I'll, I'll be quick on this because I know everybody has, pro has seen these recommendations in some form or fashion, but we did wanna provide an opportunity for the group collectively to weigh in um, as they saw fit. But I will say that the, the, the governance subcommittee, um, this is kind of their centerpiece of, uh, of recommendations I would suggest to you. Um, you know, I, the, the committee itself felt that these, that this concept would accomplish a number of things, um, including improving the collaboration between our RTD and the communities in which it serves. Um, increase the opportunity for public input at a more local level. Um, it's more likely that uh, the public would probably comment if they could do it in a, a, a local form versus of course, having to, to go um, downtown and, and, and do that at RTD offices. Um, we do believe that there's um, an opportunity to advance the social equity goals um, that have been discussed by, by this committee through community-based transit plans and really an opportunity to identify any transportation gaps with uh, uh, locally elected officials and, and residents 
that, um, that have, uh, I would suggest to you a pretty good understanding of where those gaps exist. Um, pr promote also innovative mobility solutions at the local level. I think I've harped on that enough, but just an opportunity because, I mean, locals obviously have a, um, have a, have a perspective which in concert with, um, with RTD staff, I think would, would be very good in finding innovative solutions to problems or, or service or lack of, um, of service in areas. And last but not least, an opportunity to, ha to have a conversation about geographic equity too, which has been a conversation that the sub-regional, or sorry, the governance subcommittee has had through, uh, through its existence. So with regards to the, the actual recommendation itself, the first I'll just mention is on the me membership side. Um, and the overlying theme with membership is that the, the RTD, um, the Sub-Regional Service Council should be representative of the community in which it serves. So elected representatives uh, would obviously uh, be included on there, as well as a broad spectrum of interest and in geography that exists within that Sub-Regional Council geography. Um, with regards to the districts, there, there was quite a bit of conversation about the districts and what should be the, the mechanism of the governing unit for, for those, for those uh, districts. Um, it is the recommendation of this governance subcommittee that a work group, uh, that RTD should establish a work group um, to look at uh, amongst um, you know, various options for, 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 the, for the governance districts, um, but most notably look at the two that were thrown around by the, the governance subcommittees, one based on county geography, which is consistent with the Dr. Cog sub-regional forums, and the others based on travel shed, um, based on the, for example, the commute patterns or the the uh, the um, um, yeah, I'll just leave the the mobility patterns that exist within a community. Um, that uh, which is a very very interesting concept, and I think that's one that's worthy of further conversation. We did just some sketch back of the envelope stuff. Um, at Dr. Cog, because we really didn't have time to get into the details, but it's worthy of uh, uh, further discussion. And last but not least, um, the, the committee recommends RTD develop and submit um, a, to the sub-regional service councils on a regular occurrence. We have annual in here right now, illustrating how, um, how, how the revenues have been generated and provide a, a, what the transportation value is to the, um, to the, uh, um, to, to the revenues that are generated. And I just wanna point out, and I think General Manager Johnson made a very good point during the sub-regional meeting that it's, you know, the value is, it's really, is not even about, this is my words, not, 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 uh, not Deborah's right now. It, the value is not necessarily just the, the individual service that's provided within that service council region, but it's also about, you know, the value of connecting people. And these, this is Deborah's words. Value is connecting people to the activity centers throughout the entire district, right? That's so important that me living in where I live, that I have access to a broad network of transit service throughout the entire region. Um, and, and that value should be considered in um, uh, any report that's brought back to the, to the sub-regional service councils. Madam Chair, I'll leave it there. Uh, be interested in any comments that might be, um, that, that the um, committee might have. I think ultimately what we plan to do is um, take those comments, um, you know, and and massage this recommendation as you guys see fit, and then um, then once we have a final recommendation, it'll go through this public comment period and public hearing before we put it in the final report. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Doug. I see Lynn has her hand up, and then I have a comment as well. Great, thanks so much. And thanks Doug for this draft. Um, but we took this to the RTD board for comment. And um, so I wanted to share some of the thoughts that, that came back. I thought we had a, a really robust conversation. You know, the board and staff, I think at, at this point certainly share the commitment to increasing the two-way communication and doing it more proactively. Um, Deborah Johnson has started that process um, this is one option for you know, making that process, um, giving it some form that, that keeps it moving forward. Uh, as an overall comment, um, the, the idea that, uh, the, that RTD would convene a stakeholder group to look at the uh, geography, the, the travel sheds or counties, I guess 
we felt like that committee should, the stakeholder group should be able to look at other, some of these other issues. There are a lot of other, other pieces, membership on the councils, tasks to be performed, um, how they work with, with RTD, a plan for outreach and communication that would be shared with, with RTD um, so that they could look at some of those other things. Um, in terms of the proposal that, that the group would be responsible for developing and recommending local transit service plans, we think it's important that they be working jointly with our service planning staff. You know, service planning in, in transit is a very, uh, it's a science and an art and it, it's a profession. So, um, you know, we, we would suggest adding that in. On the membership, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good draft here. And many of you, a couple of you that I've said this to said uh, that they, they just assumed that it, that it was, um, it, that the board members would be part of this, but, but people were requesting that RTD board members whose districts overlap be included in the membership here. Um, some of the other things that membership was interesting. It got a fair amount of conversation on the board. Um, the people were suggesting that, that representatives from the TMAs, uh, from local coordinating councils, which um, really focus on transit access for seniors, for people with disabilities, for other groups, um, in case you're not too familiar with those. Uh, and that uh, representatives from chambers or economic development groups also be included. We don't want it to get too big, but you know, the, those are areas, those are groups that would uh, have a good voice. Um, I think generally the board agreed with what Doug was saying and what uh, Deborah has said about uh, the resource allocation um, that, you know, it's important to include when if reporting on value, the value is to the specific area, but it's also to the region as a whole, potentially including economic impact. So those are the main comments. There was uh, some interesting conversation about the concept of geographic equity. And I'm, I'm putting that in here um, because it's something you may want to look at as well. But, but some of the board members, a couple of the board members expressed concern that geographic equity can conflict with um, social equity. And I think where we are as a board is that we need to have that conversation. I think that, that perhaps a different term, equity is, does have a kind of a, a generally accepted meaning. So maybe it, it's more about a fairness or um, some other concept that doesn't suggest equality or one-to-one, -one, we put this in, this is what we get out, um, but that's, that's just a matter of uh, a potential conversation for the future. So thanks, we appreciate the work. Thanks Lynn for, for taking this to the RTD board and collecting those comments, that's very helpful. Um, I guess w w I would like to weigh in um, since the impetus for some of these ideas came from uh, Boulder County and one of the elements that they've often talked about which I don't see reflected is Part of our work is uh, the accountable, accountability committee is financial sustainability of RTD, which means we need to keep looking for opportunities to add resources to the overall trans, transit system. And one of those is leveraging local funds or local area funds. And indeed the legislature has tossed around the idea of making it easier to form RTDs, RTAs rather across jurisdictional boundaries to create more funding opportunities. I think that that concept needs to be included on our local service council uh, recommendation, along with the idea that if indeed a local jurisdiction or jurisdictions band together to create local services to add, I'm sorry, local resources to add to their local transit systems in integration with RTDs, that they need to be made whole, that they should not be penalized. They shouldn't lose RTD funding if they are able to raise local funding. We want to encourage that. We want to leverage more resources from the, the public and private sector. So I think that needs to be written into our proposal so it is clear that we want to create, we want to build local trust, which should help leverage additional resources into the system. And if you do that, you're not going to be penalized for that. Other comments, and I apologize that I've sort of crunched this particular topic um, in the agenda. Uh, we have seen it several times. But Doug, when is the final to get any feedback on this recommendation? Yeah, we had some times and you'll get another shot at this too. Um, you know, in, in, the, 
in the final report, or at least even before the final report, we will be preparing a list of final recommendations to go into the final report. So there will be opportunity then as well after we receive public comment. Okay. So if folks um, think of other comments they have on this, um, please send them in to Doug and Julie. And with that, I'm gonna move us on to our final topic, which is the timeline. I think Matt Matthew's going to lead us on that one. Sorry, I didn't uh, leave you much time. Nope, that's, that's fine, Madam Chair. I have plenty of time. Uh, good morning, uh, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, we are almost to the middle of April and the, uh, the final report with all of the recommendations is due uh, by July 1st. So staff propose a timeline uh, to get that done. There's some key dates in the, in the timeline. Uh, May 19th would be the last subcommittee meetings uh, where they would wrap up the draft recommendations. Then May 19th through uh, early June would be the public and stakeholder engagements, uh, that, uh, mostly uh, some online surveys, uh, given the, you know, the, um, the, the extraordinary times that we're in. Uh, then um, June 14th would be the public hearing and anticipated adoption of the subcommittee recommendations by the full committee at the regularly scheduled meeting. And then staff proposed an additional meeting on June 28th uh, to approve the final report. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions, comments on the time frame, timeline? Yeah, this is Dea. Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to be really clear in terms of the equity recommendations. Are we proposing that the equity recommendations should be presented as part of the public and stakeholder engagement? So between May and June, or can you give me a little bit more clarity on that? Uh, we're, that, that that's a good question. Um, we, we are proposing that uh, the, the um, equity analysis uh, be done concurrently with the, um, uh, as the subcommittee uh, recommendations come out. And then um, uh, basically uh, having those equity recommendations ready for the, um, for the public hearing on June 14th. Any other questions, comments on the timeline? Okay, well, thank you for putting that together, Matthew. Bottom line is we got a lot of work and not much time. So, um, but the way it's set up is we will all be released from our service July 1st. So there's a light at the end of this. Um, really at least intensive. you have to let us go. We have a you wrote a really long letter. We have a lot of reading to do. It's going to take okay. us. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Any um, comments, uh, announcements from committee members, other matters? Rebecca? Uh, thanks, Chair. I wonder if we could get a, an update at the next meeting on the latest in the federal funding um, and what, what will and might flow to RTD. I think there was another $300 million in the last as for stimulus legislation, the third tranche, and then uh, perhaps uh, Ron could give a, I'm sure he already has it summarized, a, a glimpse into the president's infrastructure proposal. Ron, is that something we can pull off? Yes, ma'am. All right. Great suggestion, Rebecca. Other questions, comments, announcements from members? If not, then we'll wrap this meeting up four minutes early, which will give you extra time to read that letter and get comments back by close of business tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Great job, chairs. <laughs>